Now, the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome, everyone, to the Wednesday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. Ian Tuttle of National Review is in for Jim Garrity today. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. We have good, bad, and crazy martinis for conservatives today. But, Ian, I have to start off with a question for you. Which is the better metaphor, now that Donald Trump is the official Republican presidential nominee, and we look at the 2016 campaign in total for Republicans up to this point, which is the better metaphor of stories that happened yesterday? One is that just as Trump becomes the nominee, the guy who invented the TV show Happy Days dies, or the fact that as Trump becomes the nominee, we get reports of a norovirus sweeping the convention staff uh, in Cleveland. So there is something contagious that's very, very bad. So which is the uh, which is the better metaphor? Oh, goodness. Why do they have to be uh, mutually exclusive? You know, it's um, <laughs> on a day when uh, there's a, a raging pathogen uh, stampeding through the Republican Party, I would say that uh, happy days are indeed gone. So, <laughs> goodness. Sometimes you, you think that uh, the hand of, hand of fate really must be at work here. Laughing, laughing at everyone. Yes, it's it's been a rocky start to the convention, although once they finally got through another rules flap uh, as it related to the vote for the presidential nominee, things smoothed out a little bit last night. There were some speakers who said nice things about Trump, like the guy who founded the UFC and uh, golfer Natalie Galbus and the lady who's in charge of Trump wineries and so forth. But the politicians spent the vast majority of their time doing the one thing that every Republican can pretty much agree on in this very divisive year, and that's that Hillary Clinton would be a horrible president of the United States. So Chris Christie was one of the lead prosecutors last night, and he tried to hammer Hillary Clinton on a couple of different issues. Hillary Clinton, as a failure for ruining Libya and creating a nest for terrorist activity by ISIS, answer me now, is she guilty or not guilty? And then he went pretty much all around the Middle East, talking about her doing the initial groundwork for the Iran nuclear deal, uh, the dumpster fire that uh, is literally occurring in Syria and beyond, uh, Boko Haram and the hashtag campaign that came in response to that. And then he got around to our own hemisphere. Hillary Clinton, as a coddler of the brutal Castro brothers and betrayer of the family of foreign fallen state trooper Werner Foster and his family, is she guilty or not guilty? And, of course, he talked about her handling poorly uh, classified information through the private email server, which is something that Donald Trump Jr. also brought up. Let me tell you something about risk. If Hillary Clinton were elected, she'd be the first president who couldn't pass a basic background check. Well, it's always better, uh, Ian, if you can actually promote your own guy rather than tearing down the opponent. But in this situation... Uh, it's the best card the Republicans have. So going after Hillary Clinton, I thought they did it pretty effectively last night. This is the best case you can make. And what the election is sort of going to come down to ultimately, I think, is who makes the more effective case that the other guy is going to be the end of civilization if elected, <laughs> which is sort of what both both sides are saying, because neither one is particularly thrilled um, about uh, about their own choice. So what you did see last night you know, with, um, with Christie, who, as an aside, really demonstrated for those who forgot why he is a talented politician, you know, the last several months of obsequiousness aside, <laughs> what you saw last night was an effective prosecution um, of that case of saying, you know, Hillary's going to be a disaster for reason A and B and C, and, and we, can, we can go down the list. That's probably enough to pull some undecided people into into the Trump camp, sort of right leaning or, or center leaning people who realize, you know, who, who take her security breaches seriously, those sorts of things. I think that's that's not an ineffective strategy. Unfortunately, it brings with it the obvious repost, which is you. Yeah, but look who you're offering. When we say this is a good martini, it's sort of uh, the best that the best we can manage because it's the best it's the best that really Republican um, advocates of Trump um, who are not sort of true believers can manage at this point. And to the extent that it's a case to be made, you know, I think you saw Ryan and McConnell and some of the others make it about as well as could be done last night. A lot of reaction positive, even from people who don't like Trump very much for Trump Jr. What did you make of that? Mm -hmm. A competent speech. You know, one of my 
my colleagues is is going to be writing something, so I'll crib from him a little bit. You know, it's a it's a speech that um, and a sort of um, the the performance overall um, was very attractive in a certain way. It had a certain uh, a certain magnetism. You know, he's the type of of figure you could sort of see making a name for himself in you know political circles in in New York or something like that. As far as as making the case again, he he didn't do a bad job. It's not particularly helpful i don't think to have the sort of best speaker on your behalf be one of your family members <laughs> um which of course is sort of the the theme of the week the um you know the, the corleone family um uh, sort, of, sort of running the show at the rnc this week i think that presents its own um set of of problems don jr did a pretty solid job as these things go Let's move on to the bad martini now. In addition to Donald Trump Jr., Donald Trump Sr., the uh, not even presumptive nominee anymore. He is going to be the nominee. He just has to accept it on Thursday. Gave a brief video message. I'm guessing it was taped, but I don't know for sure, uh, saying how what a great moment this was for him. And the, the tone and tenor of that brief message just rubbed the wrong way for uh, some people, including uh, the editor of National Review Online, that would be uh, Charles Cook, and he wrote, there was something about the way Donald Trump spoke last night that made me wonder how much he really wants to be president. Although they disagree with one another vehemently as to the likelihood of Trump's winning in November, both the never-Trump and pro-Trump contingents agree strongly on one thing, that this is an important election and that it would be a disaster if Hillary Clinton were to prevail. On the face of it, Trump believes this. But how much? Looking into the camera yesterday, Trump said giddily that he'd never forget this moment. Now, I dare say that's true, but I couldn't help but notice that he said, as might a dilettante for whom this is all a lark. From my perspective at home, Trump, in his moment of truth, sounded less like a man who understands the stakes here and who is desperate to win and more like a high school homecoming king who is pleased to have been chosen uh, for the big night. And he compared that to Paul Ryan, who desperately wants to see policy changes, and and Mitt Romney, who believed to his core that he was the best man for the job. And then he also uh, includes an excerpt from a New York Times story where right after John Kasich dropped out, Donald Trump Jr. approached one of Kasich's advisors and asked if uh, Kasich would like to be the most powerful vice president in history. Donald Jr. explaining that his father, as a vice president, would be in charge of domestic and foreign policy. Then what the advisor asked would Trump be in charge of? Making America great again, was the casual reply. So I think we've uh, brought this up from time to time in the Three Martini Lunch, Ian, about how serious Trump is and how serious he is about actually understanding the things the president would have to deal with. I don't know how much I read that into the video statement last night, but uh, how much do you think that was on display? I thought it was a, it was slightly more sober than than Charlie, but particularly given the 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 New York Times piece you cite there, I think this is an this is a really pressing question. Now that there there's no really escape hatch uh for Trump barring something just really out of left field. The New York Times piece is just extraordinarily damning in this in this regard. It's the clearest evidence to my mind that we've seen that this is basically for Trump. What do you get for a man who has everything? You know, the, I, the nomination for a, a major political party, I guess. If this is true, um, and I think there's good reason to believe it just because of the way you've seen Trump handle himself and handle this whole process, if he were to be elected, you would have a really you could potentially have a, a bizarre situation in which you have a sort of de facto president in in Mike Pence might not be the worst. worst I was going to say, isn't that sort of reassuring in some ways? Yeah, it's definitely not the worst thing in the world. Um, it, but it also presents serious problems if Donald Trump is the the face of a government, an administration that really behind the scenes is doing all the things that Donald Trump uh, publicly opposed on on the trail. This is bad. We've you know, chosen this as a bad martini because it's bad in principle. There are certain duties and, and responsibilities that we expect a president to, to take on and we expect a vice president to take on. We need those things to assume a proper order so that we can sort of maintain the strictures of constitutional order. And effectively, what Trump seems to want is more of a president-prime minister relationship where the prime minister does all the work and the president's more of a figurehead. I mean, really what Trump wants to do is to, to call into the Sunday morning shows and pardon the Thanksgiving turkey and, you know, do, do the fun stuff and, and be the face without having to do any of the work. That's not our system and it raises serious 
questions of what that order would look like and, and whether it's really sort of sustainable um, in a, if, if put into practice. Looking at the, the polls, that's probably something we won't have to approach at the moment, but it really would be kind of extraordinary if you were to be elected and then effectively delegate. Again, maybe not the worst thing in the world. Maybe maybe that would <laughs> maybe that would be uh, the best case uh, scenario in a Trump presidency. But this is really just sort of um, a stunning hypothetical to think through. On to the crazy martini now, and I don't think either one of us, Ian, is full time in the Milo Yiannopoulos defense business. Uh, for those who don't know who. Milo is. Uh, there are certain things he would probably tell you about himself in the first 30 seconds. Uh, he writes for Breitbart. He loves Donald Trump, even calls him daddy, uh, which is a bit disturbing, actually more than a bit disturbing. It's, uh, it's wildly disturbing. <laughs> yes, he will, he will tell you that he is gay, and he will also tell you that he's a provocateur, uh, especially on issues related to political correctness. Uh, as a result of his activity, uh, what most people think is his less than uh, charitable review of the new Ghostbusters movie, particularly aimed at uh, Leslie Jones. His Twitter account has been permanently suspended. Here's the message that he got. Hello, your account has been permanently suspended for repeated violations of the Twitter rules, specifically our rules prohibiting, participating in, or inciting targeted abuse of individuals. Given that you have previously received repeated warnings for similar violations, your account will not be restored. Ian, I... Don't know what he said to her. I don't know what he said about potentially other issues that led to this. I'm guessing he didn't threaten anyone's life or that would probably have been uh, reported on at this point. Right. So this is uh, Twitter deciding that uh, it bans speech that it doesn't like. And that is very, very troubling. Yeah, that's that's the the nut of the issue here. I hold no brief for Milo Yiannopoulos. I have uh, strong opinions, all of which almost all of which are negative. But what you effectively saw is, is Twitter say this really is not an explicit violation of sort of laid down rules necessarily as much as eh, we don't like this. And this, this, this guy creates problems for us. Um, and so we're going to kick him out. The problem, of course, is that they do that on a whim. Now we're seeing you know, people um, in Milo's defense bring up all of the, uh, the folks who are tweeting threats to cops and as someone rightly noted, you know, the uh, Ayatollah Khamenei tweeted that uh, he wants a genocide against Israel. And, of course, he still has a Twitter account. So in the logic of Twitter world, um, whatever Milo Yiannopoulos said about the new Ghostbusters movie is worse than, than calling for the extermination of, of Israel. I've made the case that this is effectively why conservatives um, need to create social media networks and to create these uh, types of institutions um, of their own because they, look Twitter is a private company they can they can ban whoever they like we don't have any recourse um, you know and if you if if you're frustrated about that then don't use Twitter the alternative though is is one that is going to require creating alternative institutions and that's something that conservatives frequently don't seem to be willing to do they'd rather, complain about the hypocrisy of, of Twitter for saying, you know, for calling itself sort of a paragon of free speech and then banning folks like Milo. It's entirely appropriate to call it that hypocrisy, but that's not going to win in the end. You're not going to really force the hand of these multi-billion dollar social media networks and other technology institutions uh, to which everyone is, is really beholden. I mean, Facebook to take another example, has 1.4 billion active users. I mean, 15% uh, of the entire Earth's population is on Facebook. It's not going to be conservative pundits in the U.S. who make a change in Facebook's banning protocols. You're going to have to create alternatives that can sustain themselves in the marketplace. That's going to be the real solution. It's amazing. Also, this is completely off the subject. Well, at least mostly off the subject. But the uh, the political firestorm that has erupted over this Ghostbusters remake because people think <laughs> it wasn't going to be funny. And I don't know if it's funny. I have no intention uh, of seeing it. But the uh, thing that I've heard about this movie that I find perhaps even more disturbing than not being funny is that, you know, the original Ghostbusters was very 
uh, anti-big government, and this one apparently embraces big government. So oh, I'm sure, I'm sure it was kind of a perfect uh, a perfect storm, or, or the left played this so well because so many people were upset that they were doing sort of this transparently feminist remake, and then the trailer came out and everybody said it's not funny, and you're saying okay, it's not funny because it's all women. And then it came out. We said, no, it's genuinely not funny. And then they said, no, it's funny because it's women. I mean, it's just a it, it, it's a disaster of identity politics from beginning to end. I'm, I'm not going to be uh, spending my money to see it either. So I, I applaud the brave conservative movie critics like uh, Sonny Bunch and, yes. and others who who spent their their hard earned dollars to to go evaluate it. Uh, if you don't follow Sonny Bunch on Twitter, do it just for the movie a commentary, uh, if nothing <laughs> else. Right. His political commentary is good, too, but uh, not only his uh, movie commentary, but his insistence that he's right about uh, his, his movie thoughts is hilarious. So It is. Ian, uh, we'll find out what happens tonight. We've got Ted Cruz tonight, uh, who's perhaps not even going to endorse Trump in his speech. We've got Mike Pence, so plenty to talk about tomorrow. Almost there. Halfway there. <laughs> Over the hump. Ian Tuttle of National Review. And for Jim Garrity, I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today and tune in again on Thursday for the next Three Martini Lunch.